Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I did take the time and liberty to have President Trump introduce me today. Uh, just to summarize what he was going to say, uh, he said this presentation was a huge, beautiful thing. Uh, to say, I know a lot about this topic, not as much as he does, because the deep fakes are used, you know, to impersonate people, and it leads to a lot of fake news, which we don't like. like news. Uh, and man, I, I was recording that at like midnight last night in my closet because I was trying not to wake people up. Uh, so after all that work, we, we couldn't get it to work up here on the screen, but that's all right. Um, you know, technology is uh, is always susceptible to failure, and that would be a central piece of uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So we'll, we'll just advance through this if we can. This doesn't even work, so would you help me out? Thank you. Doesn't work? Yeah. Well... There we go. All right. Here we go. There we go. All right. So this this is me. We got a little bit of an introduction before. And uh, so I, I did work for 10 years at the Central Intelligence Agency. I was an operations officer. Uh, not bad for the Kansas City kid, right? Um, uh, it was my job to go overseas, recruit spies, steal secrets. And uh, after 10 years, I decided to come back here to home to Kansas City, where I grew up. Um, I was a William Jewell graduate, and now I've, after 20 years in my career working in the private sector government, I've come back to William Jewell as the Chief Information Security Officer and a professor of uh, practice in our new cybersecurity degree, which we're starting in the fall. Uh, so this is, this is me. Uh, and because we are, uh, we're apolitical here, uh, we decided to pick on both presidents. So uh, let's take a look at this if it works. Everything fall down again? Oh. <laughs> what are you going to do? So, okay. <laughs> I would urge you to, uh, to Google. Uh, yeah. What if you slow down the, the YouTube screen? It might be on just like, a, I don't know, times 30? It could be, and I appreciate that. Uh, and and it's uh, and, and thank you thank you. I'm going to now triage this after the presentation. So if I ever present this again, uh, I'll know how to do it better again next time. But you know this is why we test. So um, I would urge you to Google President Biden and the magic pistachio. It's 28 seconds of uh, pure enjoyment. So uh, that's fine. We can move on. So the thing about deepfakes, and I presume most people know at this point a little bit about what deepfakes are and how they're used, um, it can be both audio and video deepfakes. I was going to give you a, an example of both of those. The first one was an audio deepfake of President Trump. The second one was a video deepfake of the uh, of, of President Biden. So you yeah, know, this is great, and they are a lot of fun. Thank you. Appreciate that. They are a lot of fun, uh, particularly when you can, you know, put other faces on other characters. And there's a lot of fun videos out there on YouTube. And uh, I personally enjoy the Sylvester Stallone in Home Alone, which is a great one if you have you have time, because uh, it's both his face and his voice uh, for that. And uh, it, they can be a lot of fun. Unfortunately, in the business world. Um, they've now entered into a realm where they are a new form of business email compromise. And scammers, threat actors, bad actors, whatever you want to call it, are now using this technology and have been for a few years to extract millions of dollars from companies or extract sensitive information, sensitive IP, credentials, using that as a way to 
to get in inside a company and extract other items of value. And that's really scary, uh, considering it's exceptionally hard for us to know at times when the person we're talking to or even seeing on a video call is real. In the case of the $25 million, that was a finance officer at a multinational company who joined a Zoom call and saw several of his colleagues on the call. And none of them were real. That's pretty scary stuff. And while that's not going to happen to most people every single day, the solution to defeat these things is something that everyone should know. Not only because it's going to be helpful in defeating this type of attack, but it's also really good security and business practices just to make sure we get things right. So we're gonna talk about that today. And I'm gonna inject a little bit of my experience coming from uh, 10 years as an intelligence officer, using some of the skills and strategies we used and how to apply it to this particular challenge because the two things match up exceptionally well. So we're now seeing deep fakes as part of multiple scams or crimes. And it's only going to get more prevalent, uh, particularly when you think about disinformation uh, with an election coming up. Experts are predicting that this election uh, and the content that will be available to anyone who has access to a computer is going to be uh, more influence, potentially more influenced by disinformation than any other single event in our history. So we have to we have to prepare ourselves. Why do these things seem so real? Why is it that you get on a phone call and you think that whomever you're talking to, they sound like the person, maybe their intonation, uh, the the words that they use, sounds like the person. But in, in actuality, they're not. Because I don't know about you all, I've played around with some of the deep fake applications that are free online, and some of them really <laughs> suck. I mean, they just, they're terrible. Um, I, I originally thought, maybe, so I used to work for Elon Musk when I was at Tesla, and I thought, <coughs> well, I kind of know how he talks. I spent a lot of time with him. I'm going to use Elon for this one. And it sounded like, sort of like Elon, if he was sucking a helium out of a balloon. <laughs> and while that may have personally given me a lot of joy to hear that, it wasn't going to necessarily portray the authenticity and accuracy of what I was going for. So I'm, I'm bummed about the President Trump piece because it was, pretty, it was pretty good. So how is it that technology like that that we see where they just can't seem to get it right is actually effective in, in extracting millions of dollars out of the company? The reason is... Before anyone picks up the phone and runs a deep fake impersonation on a target, they do a lot of homework. They have a tremendous amount of data. Not only data that authenticates the person that they're impersonating, but they have data and information about the person they're targeting. And all of that is available because of the pervasiveness of our PII, of our lives, of our information on social media, thanks to uh, breaches and all the information that's available. It's not hard these days to research a target, to know them extremely well, and also to research and gather multiple clips of audio and, uh, and, and also uh, habits, uh, lifestyle habits about the, the individual they're impersonating. So that's, that's the, one, the one problem, the first problem. And the second is if there are specific AI algorithms used in these particular types of attacks that are specifically designed to authenticate quickly. And that's not what you see when you log into some of these programs online. You have to record your voice, you have to upload it, you wait in a queue, it processes it, and then it gives you your file. And that was perfect for my use case, I thought, this morning. But it's not how these things work when they're on the phone. You sound, it has to sound like you're talking to a real person in real time. And the technology exists to do that. The third problem is that these phone calls are targeting individuals 
with someone at a very senior level who Im implores this person to act quickly because they're in a tight spot. They need help. We got to blow through, we got to blow past the protocols because I'm, I'm out here in the field right now. I'm taking grenades in the trenches, John, and I need you to, uh, I need you to get this money out here. So that, so that was a wedding crashes reference, by the way. <laughs> but, okay. And so the, uh, he got it, thank you. Um, the, uh, the, the urgency creates stress. When we're under stress, we don't stop and think about what we're doing. And so this is kind of the perfect storm for these scenarios in which they authentically will create, um, you know, the, the situations or conditions for this fraud to occur. There's also something just about human nature, and uh, really this should be coming more from Dr. Stacy Thayer and, and our cyber psychologist than it is for me, but I, I borrowed a little bit of research which still has stood the test of time uh, from Dr. Moravian in 1960, analyzed how people interpret information when they communicate, and fundamentally 93% of communication is nonverbal. So when you get someone on a video call and they look and act authentically to the person you believe you're talking to, your brain is telling you to trust. And even if it's an audio call, your brain is still telling you to trust because you're hearing the voice, it sounds authentic, they're using the words, they're telling stories, they can answer questions, and it all sounds like what we would expect. And that's also part of the problem. <laughs> so, I consulted the expert on these topics. <laughs> I thought about fighting fire with fire. And ChatGPT tells us if we want to defeat audio deepfakes, we need to use a voice biometric authentication system. Um, the way those work is you take the audio sample, you run it through the algorithm, it runs a check on its databases, it tells you if it's authentic or good based on the sample set that it has, which is all to be predetermined. And unfortunately, it doesn't work on a phone call because phone calls are in real time. So there are some great technology solutions out there. A lot of these are being used now in place of multi-factor authentication. You're using your voice to authenticate. That scares me a little bit. Because I think anytime you rely on a technological solution to defeat technology, you're opening yourself up for the possibility of the opposition's technology evolving faster than yours does. And so, again, I'm going to talk about how we strip that away and look for a solution that gets us past this challenge. And it, it is horribly simple when we really think about it. <clears throat> So, um, I think those who are not technologically sort of inclined, and I know several people I work with that, you know, would still be using a flip phone if they possibly could. Uh, maybe even some of them are, and you know, I like to I like to rib them a little bit for that. But they may actually have the advantage here over those of us who are incredibly technologically inclined and look for technological solutions to lean on. Uh, in this case. We have to go old school. And so I'm going to talk about thinking like a spy. Uh, it was not to my advantage when I was out in the field running an intelligence collection operation to be walking around with a smartphone in my pocket. Why is that? What could you possibly uh, be able to glean if you're a foreign intelligence service trying to track location? Sure. Mainly it's location. But correlating who you're meeting with, with their signatures, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so smartphones were the enemy for me. And back when I was doing this, not everybody still had them, so you can kind of get away with that. In this day and age, if you don't have a smartphone, you probably are a spy, <laughs> right? And so even the agency has to evolve through these types of challenges to be able to uh, think about how to defeat technology when you have to have technology with you to be authentic. But the real value in a solution like this is that uh, removing tech out of the equation isn't gonna, has no implications for espionage, at least uh, unless any of you are engaged in some type of activity that we should talk about later.
but um, the the way that we use authentication when logging in to systems, we use multi-factor authentication, right? We have a, a token, we have a, an app, we get a text message, email, whatever you want to call it. And the same principle applies to what we are talking about here. Whenever that communication occurs where the threat actor is trying to impersonate a, uh, an individual and lure a victim into uh, sharing some type of information. The victim, in that case, the potential victim, can never move a transaction forward on that call. So we have to help them understand by creating the policies in our organizations and also training on the fact that it's never okay to do this. And our leadership also has to know that it's never okay to call an employee and expect them to provide this type of information in a phone call without some type of verification or authentication. So I skipped down a little bit to number four, but every time one of these types of calls occurs, if the employee would just say, got it, hangs up the phone, waits five seconds, calls the person who just called them, not from the number they called them from, but for the number that they are known to have, that's the first opportunity to authenticate. Now, that's not going to defeat a scenario where you've got SIM swapping involved, and they're just going to answer the phone and expect that. So if you are really concerned about that level of risk and, and problems, face-to-face uh, -face authentication is always the best. Uh, if that's not possible, then looking for alternative opportunities by contacting a boss, getting somebody else to try and find other ways to verify, just so you have a you have a multi-person solution and not just putting that pressure on the employee to be the one to have to make that decision. Getting somebody else to say, yep, this is authentic, we should we should do this. And again, I'm going to emphasize this because it's the most important piece of all of this. Like most security solutions, it's not the technology, it's the person. And we have to train people to recognize potential situations that could create this type of risk and help them feel comfortable making that correct decision in the moment, even when someone is impressing upon them the sense of urgency. It's much more important to get this right than it is to get that cash transaction wherever it's got to go in five minutes. Yeah. So what does this look like? This is right out of the pages of spy trade ground. Person gets a phone call, they get the ask, they end the phone call. They either call the person back the known number they call them from, or not that they call them from, but the known number that they have for them. And this is where implementing a very simple set of, we call them oral paroles, <coughs> but it's a code. It's a code that you have already predetermined that people know, and you got to change it, just like an authentication token has to change every 30 seconds or so. You have to do it with these things, too. But it's a simple code exchange. Hey, boss, I know you need this money, but I just wanted you to know that I'd love going to the movies after work. And the boss should know. Well, I don't have time because I'm always bicycling. Now, if the boss truly is always bicycling, bicycling is not a good code word. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, exchanges like this make sense only if the person doesn't really do those things because you don't want the threat actor to have researched their target and then is able to provide something authentic. So it, this may sound like it's kind of out of left field on a phone call where they're talking about exchanging funds or they need credentials or something and it's really time sensitive. And that's the point. It shouldn't make a lot of sense. It needs to be something that would catch them off guard because while they can answer questions or maybe able to answer certain questions, I don't like the idea of saying, well, if you're really my boss, you would know what you gave me for my birthday on whatever, whatever. Right? 
because maybe maybe there's Facebook photos of that. Mm-hmm. Here's me receiving this gift from my boss because I'm so happy and proud. <laughs> and they would be able to answer that question. I also don't like asking them questions you know they wouldn't know the answer to. Because uh, broken clocks, right? Twice a day, right? So having established keywords with phraseology or something that is kind of out of left field, but gives you the opportunity to exchange two known keywords. The keywords are movies and bicycle. I don't <laughs> care if you get that sentence perfectly right. I love going to the movies after work. You might say, I'm really tired, I'm going to the movies now, because you can't remember that sentence. It doesn't matter what you say. The point is you use the word movies. And the point is the response could say, oh, I can't go on bicycle. It doesn't matter. What matters is you hear those two words and that code is exchanged. Technology free, also free, which is nice to find security solutions these days that don't cost us any money. But ultimately, going old school, injecting a bit of spy train craft, that can make you feel cool, that's fine if you want. <laughs> but it's the way to go, and it's the way to get past these threats. It's not going to change the fact that they are going to continue to proliferate, to increase, but they will continue to target victims. They will continue to ramp up and amp up up their activities if they continue to be successful. So if we want to divert away from this type of a threat, we have to demonstrate that we're able to stop it. We used to think about protecting ourselves in the agency sort of this way. We know that we're never going to be an impenetrable target. There's always going to be some vulnerability somewhere, some piece of technology that will evolve. But the goal is to make ourselves a hard enough target that it's not worth the time of that adversary. And they go after somebody else who's a softer target. It's kind of like, how do you avoid being eaten by a bear? (laughs) Just run faster than the slowest guy. That's sort of the mentality and the principle around protecting ourselves from deep fakes. Happy to discuss more, happy to talk offline. Um, Here's my contact information, my LinkedIn information. Please connect, would love it, would love to talk. Uh, Also, if you want more information on what we're doing around cyber, uh, and William Jewell, please check out our website. Um, we proudly launched Hilltop Technologies yesterday, which is a cyber tech startup located on campus of William Jewell for students to have opportunities to work in a real cyber startup to part of their education. I'm really excited about that. Also, I want to thank sponsors who allowed this talk today and the opportunity for us all to be here. Um, thank you for having me and happy to answer any questions we have. <laughs> two, three. two or three questions 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 all right yes. so we're actually doing something very similar to the deep fakes but we're making a word of the day that we have them ask like if the cto calls me and tells me to shut down a customer instance i go what's the word of the day and from what you've described uh it feels it would be much more difficult to get our employees to agree to two passphrases. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, what is the reasoning behind that versus being up front and saying, what's the word of the day? Well, it's a, it's a really good question. And fundamentally, it kind of depends on the level of risk and how much you're willing to invest in security measures to protect what you have to protect and what the threat level is to, right? How do you communicate the word of the day to employees? Uh, we have Slack, a uh, general channel, everyday users. <laughs> Got it. So the, the problem I would see, and by the way, I am not meaning to criticize this because you're, you're stepping up the game more than most others, which is awesome. So you're in the right direction. I think you have to think about anything that is password related, that's communicated digitally within your company is susceptible to, to being acquired if anyone is compromised, right? So I could easily authenticate with that word of the day. But if I have trained my team on a passphrase that's not communicated in electronic channels, then it's really, uh, it's, a, it's a little more safe. It's a kind of a step up. 
because what you're looking for is a handshake. One word is only authenticated on one side. So you want each side to have their own word because that creates the handshake for trust. So that's the difference. That's why it's a little, yeah, it, it is more, you're right. And let's be honest, security, the more security you have, the more convenient it is. Uh, we just kind of know that, but you have to weigh the risk and decide. And so again, the lowest tech is to, when you have your team meeting once a month or whenever you have it, it's reiterating, this is our handshake and keeping it off of your email or your, your digital channels. Great question. Good work. That's awesome. You guys are thinking about that. Sir. So I recognize what you're doing with the challenge for you know, hanging up the phone, calling them back, that maybe is one of the fact that potential vulnerability in other is, you know, the challenge response with the phrase. Yep. But when you're talking about doing that outside of an organization, say a service provider with your own customers, do you have any ideas about how one might go about setting something like that up where the next party like your customers? Well, so, you know, a lot of service providers have those security questions, right? And so those are sort of those, I, that's, you know, my go-to in that situation would be if you're a service provider that you ensure you're asking, you've got security questions <laughs> with your with your customers, right? If your if that system is compromised, obviously that's going to be a problem. If that's compromised, you also have bigger problems. Right, and that's the issue: is a lot of service providers are basing on the things like on the social security, yeah, or blog posts. So yeah, this doesn't make it very simple. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, un understood. So the security questions can be a little bit more creative than just uh, what's your favorite pizza, <laughs> right? So I would be stepping up our game in that respect so that we think about things that you see the person would know that they're not necessarily going to be broadcasting as a hobby, as an interest, as a, you know, a month of significance. When did you meet your spouse? There's only 12 possibilities, right? So, so in spite of that, probably you can use our robots like agencies, so is that something that emerges is just trained by different organizations in a similar way? Yeah, so the, the question is, how are you doing that from a intelligence capability and you are authenticating with outside organizations? And you have to remember that those organizations have extremely secure channels of communication where those things are exchanged and they, they have the ability to authenticate. So when you get in the field and you exchange something for validation or authentic authentication, um, the chances that that would have been electronically compromised are extremely low because of the level of security that those entities rely on. It's not impossible, but it's also fairly trusted. So, this Do you have any thoughts with your experience in government um, and a lecture here on regulation of deep banks and particularly in social media like a lot of us maybe don't work at the level of um insider threat and the types of ransoms but we do see a lot of um, ai generated imagery both video and photo on yeah. like linkedin the instagram etc TikTok. Yeah. Um, anything that you want to share your thoughts or opinion on, on that, on regulation, of one of our street marks? Wow. It, it, so, super important question and really easy for me to say we need more, well, we need regulation, period. Um, so, you, you know, the governments are always behind technology on these things. The private sector is always faster and the bad guys are going to do it no matter what anyway. Um, I think the regulation is really important and also, um, you know, the, the service providers, the platforms that are hosting these things have the ability to implement technologies that can validate the authenticity. I think that's where regulation can occur. So YouTube, right, if they're going to post a video, needs to run that content through an AI authentication system. And if there's flags or problems, needs to go back to that poster and ask some more questions first before they allow to post that content. Now, that's just going to get into other forums and other places, right? Um, but most people don't go to dark web forums to get their insights or tell. Well, most people outside of this room, and, right? Okay, know your audience for thinking about presenting. Um, but most people are getting their information from social media and those, those entities absolutely have the technology, the engineering horsepower, 
and the intellectual capital to create those types of solutions. And so I think, one, it would be great if they just all sort of did the right thing. <laughs> um, but but the, the government could lean in there to mandate some of those technologies be used, because at least it would keep it out of the majority of the public's view, which is the, obviously the targets and who's most susceptible is the folks. We can't say you have to go through mandatory training to learn how many these things. So that's my that's my thought, but it's I would love to think more about that and probably talk a little more thoughtfully. So thank you for the question.